Welcome to Quarantine Time. I am Science Mom, this is Math Dad, and we are back with another episode of our Math and Science show. Today is day 20. And when we first started Quarantine Time, we said that we would run it for four weeks because that was the initial length of time that our schools were gonna be closed and we wanted to help out other families who were at home and had, had kids at home and wanted to have some educational content for them. I can't believe that it is four weeks already, that this is the 20th day there are more than 40 hours of content that we have made that you can watch with our math and science lessons. And it's kind of kind of amazing to us that, that this happened. Well, it really is. And there's been so much support and it's outreach. And we've got an amazing fan base here, people who are tuning in and contributing in, in lots of different ways. They're yes. sharing the content, you're sharing your own creations. And yeah, together we formed quite the community. So because of you guys, because of Jane from Washington, Camden from New York, Maggie from Wisconsin, Angie from Michigan, Kelly, Lisette, Esther from Italy, because of you guys, we are going to continue quarantine because we have about a thousand people who watch every day and we have 399 patrons who support what we do on Patreon. And we're so grateful for your support. We could not continue doing this without you. And next week is going to be an entire week of genetics, which we're quite excited about. We let our patrons vote, and that was the clear winner. That was the clear preference for next week's topics. And each week, we will let them vote on what we do the next week. We have had excellent suggestions, including one of our patrons suggested that we do a like everyday wonders, like you know, how does how does a plumbing system work? How do mm -hmm. things that we use every day? How do they really work? What's the science behind how a car works? And I thought that was a fabulous suggestion. So we'll have lots of good content coming up. But before we get started, well, in, in, in fact, aren't you uh, in today's printout? Aren't you asking them to help us oh, come up with yes. plans for an actual show? We're, we're, so just for fun, in today's printout, I thought um, it would be fun if I let you design your own episode of Quarantine, and then maybe for episode forty-two or some special episode, maybe we'll have a viewer-directed episode of Quarantine where we'll take one of these submissions or a mashup of a couple of our favorites and we'll do the science lesson, the math game and you know the engineering challenge and drawing prompts that you come up with. So here's the handout for today is a design your own. Now we have a special guest today that I'm very excited about but I do want to share our art showcase first. And so we're going to bring up our art showcase and then we'll talk about our special guest. Yesterday's drawing prompt was to create <laughs> a plant-animal hybrid. We talked about photosynthesis and about how different members of the plant kingdom are, and we had some fantastic submissions. So this elephant oh, are, sucks are, are up- we at the right view? I, I didn't pay attention to make sure we weren't- the, We weren't we, we small? Were sharing. Yeah, All we, right. we, we've done well, this before. We are small. Oh. There we go. Now, okay. now we're full screen. There we go. So we, we had some great submissions and I loved this elephant sucks up water and carries it with it. A leaf font. A leaf font, <laughs> yep. Good job, Allison. Pig, pig asparagus. asparagus. <laughs> Pigs need to be taller. A bush owl lives in the garden. Great work, Ivan from Italy. This is Lily the Grow, a mix between a grass and a cow. Milk is green and it tastes like grass. And she uses photosynthesis to get her food, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Carson, it's a bird of dial. Lives in your house and saves people when they are hurt. Very nice. Philanthropic animal. Our, our tortoise wandered into our house the other day. We did. Yeah, we our left desert, our door open. If we leave our back door open, our desert tortoise will wander inside. A cadence. A human and a, and a, a can't. Hue cat. A hue cat. Awesome. <laughs> a day suck. It's a daisy mixed with a duck. It grows up <laughs> a pond and is the tallest plant in the world. Very nice. Good job, Kylie. Probably quacks. Ooh, Quinn. A dog cat lives by the river. Very nice. A cag. Cag. A hemlock snake. Half snake, half water hemlock. Great work, Noah. And a floweroceros. <laughs> Very Flower nice, yeah. Babesh. I love it. <laughs> this rose bunny hops around when it gets scared. The bunny turns red because the rose turns red. And then when it isn't, it isn't scared, it turns white. Oh, I like that. Good job, Ember. <laughs> And this one, its purpose is that it's cute. That does look like a very cute little plant animal. Mm. And we'll do one more. Great job, Lena, a rose kitty and an ivy mouse. 
Oh, with, cute. Yeah, with a pokey tail, animals would leave it alone. They definitely would. They definitely would. <laughs> this reminds me, when I was, I had a class in college where we, we went really in detail to sort of the physics behind how plants work and how crop systems work. And one of the questions we had on our exam was if you were a photosynthetic organism and your energy requirement was, you know, X amount of energy per day, what surface area would you need to have if your skin was to be photosynthetic and, you know, your skin would have chlorophyll and bring in light, assuming that you don't move? Because if you move, your energy requirement goes up. But if you were just going to be standing still and have the same energy requirement that your body has now just for basic breathing, how much surface area would you have to have? And the answer was way more than you actually have in your skin. You would have to have like these big sails of green skin coming off your back in order to get enough energy. So this is why plants don't move because moving takes a lot of energy. And if you're doing photosynthesis, then you don't have the bandwidth, you don't have the power to do that. That makes sense. Yes. Now with that little um, introduction to sort of our normal routine, I am really excited to introduce our special guest today because today we have Dr. Chantel Marshall she is a professor at the same school that Math Dad teaches at, and she is going to talk with us about psychology. Now, I'll tell you, I have, I have three kids, and one of my kids is very extroverted. She loves people, loves crowds, loves being you know, with her friends, and it has been really hard for her to be home the last four weeks. And I thought it would really be helpful not only to our family and to my daughter, but to you guys as well, to talk about the psychology behind isolation, because we're living in some really unusual circumstances. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Science mom Liza and science mom Krista and Emily will be gathering our questions and we'll have a little open Q&A at the end. But I'm going to interview Dr. Marshall first and ask her just some questions about how she got into psychology. And then, of course, what her research and what she knows about social interactions can, can tell us about coping with being at home all the time. So everyone give claps and snaps for Dr. Marshall. Hello. I can, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Excellent. All right. Hello. I'm so excited to be here. I'm actually oh. a really huge fan. <laughs> we are super excited to have you here. I'm going to bring you just a little bit bigger for this, this introduction part. And yeah. first, I would love to have you tell us what, what does a psychologist do? What, what is psychology? Yeah. Thank you for asking. And like I said, I'm a really big fan. Um, and I actually have a lot of friends who watch the show. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to Ben and Maya, who I know are watching out on the East Coast with their mom, Pavi, who's a good friend of mine. Um, and so a psychologist is actually someone who studies the mind of people. So it comes from the word psyche, which means brain, and ology, which means the study of. So it is um, people who want to know a lot about humans and why we do what we do and um, why we feel the way we feel and why mm. we think the way we think. And so not only do we know a lot about those things, but we're always trying to ask new questions and figure out even more stuff. And so we do something called research, which I know you talked about the scientific method in a previous show, and we actually use the exact same method to figure out more about um, how people act and behave and, and think um, and why they do those things. I love it. So with that introduction, I mean, it seems mm -hmm. like everybody would want to be a psychologist because that sounds fascinating. But tell right? us about why you decided to be a psychologist. Yeah, so um, I was actually a really shy kid. And for a lot of people who know me now, that might be a surprise. <laughs> But uh, I didn't talk very much when I was little. I just kind of hung out in the background. But what I did was watch people a lot. And so some kids might be like that, right, where they're kind of um, in the corner and they don't really seem to take up a lot of space, but they're watching everybody and trying to figure out um, what's going on. And so I was definitely that kid who just watched people and, and realized that there were patterns to what people did. And then when I took my first psychology class, I realized that this was a whole area of study that I could take a lot of classes in. And so I just kept taking more and more classes in psychology and eventually became a psychologist myself. Excellent. And what, what kind of, what kind of training did you have? Like, what do you, if you want to be a psychologist, mm -hmm. what do you need to do? Yeah. So the first thing was that uh, I went to school uh, for college. So many 
students watching already know about college. And when you're in college, you have something called a major, which is the area that you take the most classes in. And so I took uh, mostly psychology classes and that was at a school called UCLA uh, down in Los Angeles. And it's a great school, lovely school. And so once I was there, I found out that you could take even more classes in psychology. And I found out that there is something called a PhD, which is a degree that you get after you've gone to college. And that's why people call me doctor because a PhD means that you are an expert in something. So I took even more classes in psychology and then I actually did my own research. So that's where I became the scientist of people and started asking my own questions and finding my own answers. And so I got my PhD at Stanford University, which is near San Francisco. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of times we get confused because we call people in the hospitals and in the, you know, in the uh, doctor's office, doctor, and they have what's called an MD, a medical degree. Um, and the others of us have a PhD, and that means we are an expert in some area of study. And for me, it's psychology. Are there any um, common misconceptions that you find people have about psychology when you tell someone that you're a psychologist? <laughs> yeah, so the biggest one is that a lot of people, when they hear psychologists, they think of a therapist. Um, and that's the person that you talk to when you're feeling really sad or anxious or upset. Um, and those psychologists are real and they're awesome and they're great, but that's actually just one area of psychology. Psychology is actually a really big field. So some of us study things like um, how kids learn, for example. Some of us look at the brain and what's happening in the brain when we are doing certain things or having certain thoughts. Um, and some people do look at what happens when the brain is kind of sick or the brain is not acting correctly and, and they might go in and do therapy or something like that. And the area that I study is actually called social psychology. And it is the area that really focuses on how it is that people affect one another. So mm -hmm. how is it that we are um, influenced, right? Uh, how is it that we're affected by our friends, our family, even strangers? Um, and how is it that we actually affect other people as well? And so I'm a social psychologist, but a lot of people think I'm gonna ask them about their childhood or lay them on a couch and ask them questions, but I don't have the education to do that. Um, I, but I, I might ask you things about your friends or what kind of TV you watch or things like that, because I'm interested in how people learn from each other and, and behave around each other. I am so excited to have you, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, to have you here. And because this area of expertise, I think is something that we really need right now because we're, we're living in just re a really unusual situation right now. I'm, millions of people around the world are being told to mm -hmm. shelter in place, to stay home yeah. as much as they can. And that's really different from how we normally live. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us, um, I guess first, the first thing I wanna ask is, is it normal for isolation to be hard? Yes, <laughs> it's unbelievably normal for isolation to be hard. So um, this is a fantastic question because it gets to why I love social psychology and really one of the basic, basic facts about humans. And that's that we're a social animal. And what that means is that we just really like hanging out with each other. We like our friends, our family. Um, for those of us who have a job, we like our coworkers um, and even strangers, right? So if you think about it, if you've ever gone to a park and there's nobody else there, it's kind of fun for a little while to play on everything by yourself, but after a while it gets boring because you were kind of hoping other people would be there, right? Part of the fun of going to a park or something like that is that you could make a new friend or you could interact with people you've never interacted before. And that's a really special human trait. And I want to point out how not all animal species, right? Because we're an animal species are like that. And so one example I have is my cat who you may see zooming around because she's very excited right now. Um, but if you guys have a cat at home, you know that your cat basically lives in isolation right now, right? They are in the same space every single day. They eat basically the same thing every single day. They interact with one or two other humans and maybe a cat or a dog, but they live the same thing every single day and they're really happy right? They're really content 
with that life. And so they're not social animals in the way that we are. And so that life that they live is very appropriate for them, but it's not appropriate for humans mm -hmm. at all. We are really meant to be around each other um, and to get together. And one of the things that I think is making this particularly difficult is that we actually know that when people are stressed and right now people are feeling, you know, a little scared, a little worried, um, it actually releases a hormone called oxytocin. And that is often called the cuddle hormone in psychology because it, it not only happens when you hug someone, it also pushes you to hug someone. Mm. And so that when we're stressed, our body is telling us, go find people, go find people. Because for humans, that has often meant safety, right? Safety mm. in numbers. And so not only do we want to be around other people all the time, but especially when we're stressed, we actually crave other people because it makes us feel better. And that's exactly what we're not supposed to be doing right now. Uh, and so I, I kind of think about it like holding your breath right? We also need to breathe. And when we are asked to hold our breath, we can, but after a while it hurts and you want to take that gasp of air. And so for a little while we can stay isolated at home, but after a while we feel that need to be around other people and it can be very, uh, very stressful and really just like a negative experience. So I just want everyone to know that it is completely normal to feel upset by having to stay home and, and be isolated and, and not think that you should be okay with it. That is, that is reassuring to know, because I know, especially, um, and, and maybe you could talk just a little bit about extroverted versus introverted, because yeah. Matt's dad and I, we are, we are <laughs> introverts at heart. And if we have something planned for the weekend, like a social gathering, and it gets canceled, both of us are like, oh, good. We can stay <laughs> home. But as yeah. I earlier, we have a daughter who is not introverted at all. And this is harder for her than it is for yeah. us. Yes. So there is an entire area of psychology that's called personality psychology. And that looks at how people are unique and different and how that affects their reactions to what's happening around them. And so one of the big ones is this personality trait of extroversion. And as you mentioned, um, some people are extroverted and some people are introverted. So people who are extroverted are I call them the life of the party. They really like to be around other people. They are very, very social. They love getting to know strangers. Um, and they actually do get energy. They get, they get a lot of, you know, uh, uplift from being around other people. And then when they're alone, they kind of get that energy sapped out of them. And introverts are the opposite, right? So introverts really like being alone. You can think about them as being at home, reading a good book, um, not really minding that they're not at the party. And when they go and hang out with people, they actually get their energy taken from them. So they feel it's very, very um, energy. Uh, it, it takes a lot of energy to be around people for introverted people. So in this case, we, what one of the things that we do with personality is see, well, how does that affect your reaction to a situation? So even though it's the exact same situation, in this case, having to be isolated or, or sheltering in place, um, different people with different personalities will react differently. And so people who are extroverted will have a much harder time. And it's because that way to sort of recharge by interacting with other people has now been taken away from them. And it can be uh, especially hard for those people who really crave that and need that more than people who are, are more introverted and don't need it as much. Exactly. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we have a chat and why it's been so important for us to keep our chat open and to make sure that we have moderators there so that it's a, a good safe space. And I'm really curious in the chat. So you just heard, um, mm -hmm. we have more than 500 people watching right now and you just heard Dr. Marshall describe an extrovert who is energized by being around people. Mm -hmm. And when they're alone, they find that to be kind of draining. And an introvert who is energized by downtime of being alone. And when they go out and be with people, they might enjoy being with people, but it's sort of draining for them. So type an I if you feel like you're an introvert and type an E if you feel like you're an extrovert. And let's just sort of see what the what the ratio is in our chat. We'll let that go for just a minute because I saw a crazy yeah. name. That he's an introvert. A few other people. <laughs> um, ben said he's both. Catherine says mostly introvert. And yeah, some people might be both. It depends on, on some people, for example, are extroverts around their very close friends. 
So they really like being around their very close friends, but they don't like strangers as much. Um, some people are extroverted just to the max and they'll take any human interaction <laughs> they can get. Yes. Uh, and some people are just very introverted, very, very comfortable being at home. We're so, yeah, you can definitely be both. We are seeing an interesting mix in the chat. We're definitely seeing some ambiverts, people who saying that they're both mm -hmm. and half and half, but we're seeing a lot, a lot of eyes and a lot of ease as well. People who mm -hmm. identify with being one or the other. Yeah. And I think I'm saying that we have more eyes on Facebook, more introverts mm -hmm. on Facebook and more extroverts on YouTube, which is kind of interesting. Oh, I'd have to go back and like count to be sure, but just as it's like yeah. flying by, that's kind of the yeah. trend I'm seeing. Yeah. Science mom, you might be a social psychologist. That's a very, really <laughs> cool observation. That's something that we social psychologists would be interested in figuring out, right? Is there yeah. a personality trait that is drawn to a specific way of interacting online? That would definitely be a good social psychology study. <laughs> and, and I will say that I, I have noticed that our YouTube chat tends to be much more active. Like there's just more mm -hmm. on the YouTube chat, whereas the Facebook one is a little bit quieter. So yeah. that, would, that would fit with sort of past experience. Definitely. Oh, yeah. and I just want to shout out your cat is in the background now. Oh, She's there so she cute. is. There she is. Oh. <laughs> Taking a bath. <laughs> now, our the next question that I wanted to ask before we, we go to kind of more open QA is that we have we have social media right now which is really is really wonderful that we can do facetime I mean, we can do interviews like this even though we're not connecting in person i can still see you and talk to you but my daughter this week had kind of a breakdown was telling me how hard it is to be home and then she said and don't tell me i can facetime my friends because it's not the same and you know it yeah. talk to <laughs> me about this like why is facetime not the same yeah well you know the the need to be around each other is a way to be safe. So it is a way for us to um, adapt and, and to really make sure that we get through this thing called life together. And one of the reasons that being around other people is so awesome is that it allows us to do this other thing that is really uh, important to humans and that's to solve problems. So we just love puzzles we love figuring things out little kids will often take things apart just to see how they're put together um i mean we're the only species that likes you know literal puzzles where everything's broken apart and we have to figure out how it goes back together like that's kind of weird when you think about it but it's because our mind really likes solving those problems and in fact one really famous psychologist who studied children in particular called kids little scientists so they mm -hmm. constantly are, right, if you have three-year-olds, they're always asking why, 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 and it's because they want to figure out the world around them, but it's so much better to figure out the world around us with other people. And so social media really is more of an experience sharing platform, so we can talk about um, what we're going through, and we might say, I did this today. If you FaceTime someone, you might talk about how your day went or what you're looking forward to, but you're not working with people in order to do something, right? And that's what's really missing. And, and the other important thing is that physical touch is actually really, really important. A lot of psychology shows that physical touch is actually beneficial to your mental and physical health. People who uh, get more physical touch are less likely to get sick. And when they do get sick, they're less likely to stay sick for a really long time. So even a high five, right? You can't really high five yourself, but even a high five with someone else goes a really long way to making sure that we are mentally and physically healthy. And so our brains are definitely trying to tell us, go do that, go do that, even though uh, we are being told that we can't do that right now. And so again, it's, it's not the same because it's not the same, right? <laughs> Humans are really evolved to be physically around each other. And it's okay to feel like, you know, seeing someone on camera and, and hearing someone's voice isn't the same. But one of the suggestions that I do have is because we can use social media, which is pretty awesome, even, even in the face of not being able to see each other, is to use it to be with people as you do something. So one example I have is that a really good friend of mine and I have decided to watch TV together. 
So we decide to watch the exact same show at the exact same time. We make sure to hit play at the same time. <laughs> and then we text each other throughout the show. And that's one thing that it makes us feel like we're together and we're kind of reacting to the same things at the same time, which is a, another part of, of human interaction that we're missing. Um, or you could give each other a problem to solve. So you can go online and find puzzles and say, we're gonna work on it together so that we can come up with a solution. It definitely won't be the same, but it's a little bit closer to what we're used to when we're interacting with other people is to do things with each other online instead of simply sharing how your day went or how you're feeling mm -hmm. um, in those conversations. I really like that because I think when, when you get on FaceTime for a face-to-face -face conversation, you sort of feel like there are expectations for, you know, you need to sort of perform for the other person. You need to be kind of giving them what they need. But if you're watching a movie together and just texting back and forth and doing something with someone, then mm -hmm. it, feels, it feels much more natural. And there isn't yeah. sort of that, that awkward pause of like, well, now I don't know what to say. Is the conversation over or do we keep going? Yeah. You don't have any of that worry. I like that a lot. Yeah, and then you can call each other. So what we do is call each other afterwards and then <laughs> talk mm -hmm. about, so we like uh, competition shows. So we'll t call each other afterwards and say, can you believe who got kicked off? And can you, <laughs> I couldn't believe they got you know rewarded for that and things like that. So it's, it's again, it's really, really fun to do things with each other. Um, and instead of just trying to relay what you normally would, right? Because we're in yeah. really abnormal times. So we have to treat these interactions very differently than we would have otherwise. There's a lot of um, discussion in the chat about how cute your cat is. Oh, she is very cute. That's Lola. Her name is Lola. Her She's name is cute. Lola. <laughs> That's one of her favorite spots. So <laughs> now I know that um, I know that stress and anxiety isn't your area of expertise, but could you give maybe just a little bit of basic information about how to cope? especially for anyone who is really sort of taking the isolation personally. I did see one comment go up in the chat just now where someone said, I feel like all of my friends have left me, even though I know that they didn't, I kind of feel abandoned. Yeah. And that's yeah. is stressful. Yeah. So I want to uh, bring up some really interesting psychology research that speaks to this. If you feel like your friends or family members that are normally there for you can't be, or they're, you know, off doing other things or whatever it is. Um, and that, uh, it's actually painful, right? So we often talk about how much it hurts when our friends are mad at us or someone we really wanted to be our friend has decided not to be our friend um, or something like that. And so we talk about how it, it hurts. And this might sound like what we're talking about is that someone is sad or, uh, or upset. But what we know from studies about the brain is that the part of the brain that becomes active when we feel rejected is the same part of the brain that becomes active when we feel physical pain. So mm -hmm. if someone doesn't want to be our friend, it hurts in the exact same way that it hurts if we get our finger caught in the door or we fall and scrape our knee. And that pain is real. So I want you to acknowledge that the pain is real and it's not you overreacting or, you know, making too much of something that it hurts. And again, the reason is we want to be around other people. And so the opposite of that is what we don't want and it, and it does hurt. So I do want to acknowledge that. And we have a lot of stressors right now. And so I wanted to use a little, um, use some new words here for you guys. So, um, so in psychology, we talk about these things called stressors. And this is anything that is on our mind that needs solving, kind of like a problem. And so an example might be something actually positive. So let's say that you have been chosen to be in a play or you have a recital coming up for an instrument that you play. You might be really nervous about it because you wanna do well and that's called a stressor. And in order to uh, deal with the stressor, you're gonna have a resource, right? So this resource is a practice that you've been doing and all of the people in the audience who are there for you and who are gonna support you. And if you have just enough resource for the stressor, then you're fine, right? And it's a really fun experience. But sometimes we have a really big stressor, right? So really big stressor could be something like school is closed and that's not fun. And we don't necessarily feel like we have the resources to deal with it. What we have is not the same as the size of the stressor. And that's what causes us to feel that stress, that negative anxiety and things like that. And so one of the things that I wanna point out is that of course, lots of stuff is happening right now. Um, so things like um, maybe 
our parents might be having a hard time at work. Sometimes some people are losing their jobs. Of course, some people are getting sick. You know, I have a couple of friends myself who have tested positive and that's a big stressor, right? Because we don't necessarily know what to do. We don't necessarily have the resources to deal with that. And that can just be really unsettling. But I think the biggest thing right now is that we actually have a stressor that we have no idea what it is because we don't know who is going to get sick we don't know how long it is that we're going to have to stay home or how long schools and our workplaces are going to be closed so we actually have no idea what resources to use to try and deal with this stressor so we don't know if we have them and we don't know necessarily how to use them and so that is really what i think what i've seen with my friends and other people that is causing a lot of stress and so one thing that i would love for people to do is as best you can take things one day at a time maybe one week at a time because there's really no way to know how long this is going to take. And so it's it's really not going to help trying to predict things like that because it's really, there's really, again, no way to know. But uh, besides that, I think a couple of things are really important. And one is to create a routine. So as much as our brain likes to solve problems, it doesn't want to be solving problems all the time. So it doesn't want to think about every day, what time should I wake up? What should I have for breakfast? What should I do before lunch? What should I have for lunch? All of those are little stressors that we don't need. And so those things I would say, try and just develop a rhythm. Um, and that way you know exactly what you're gonna have for breakfast every day, you know kind of what you're gonna do in the mornings, you know what you're gonna have for lunch, et cetera. Because then you can put space in your day to be more creative. So maybe in the afternoon, that's when you don't really uh, put anything on the schedule and that's just your time to have fun and be creative and maybe work on the various puzzles that you've put together for yourself to try and solve maybe that's when you call your friend and you say we're gonna watch this thing together at the same time so that we can chat about it um, but you really want to make sure that you have some routine and then you have flexibility within your day to do some some fun stuff and so I definitely recommend that. And then I have a really good friend on Facebook who said that there's some really great mindfulness uh, apps and things like that specifically for children. And those are really great if you've seen adults doing that deep breathing, right? That, that's a type of mindfulness. And we know um, that that actually activates um, this big word, but it's called the parasympathetic nervous division. All you need to know about that is that that's what keeps you calm. And so deep breath, activate that, and it tells your body we're okay, we're okay, we're okay. So deep breaths are when, really good for that. When people say just take a deep breath, like there's actually science behind that, and it is. There helpful. is actually science behind it, yes. Um, and it's uh, specifically five seconds in and five seconds out is the the time that works best. And again, it's it's sort of tricking your body. And that's a really cool thing about psychology is that we can take advantage of what our body would do naturally. So basically what happens is our brain when it when it feels that we are breathing deeply and slowly it thinks oh we must be okay because we're taking nice slow deep breaths and if you're taking short shallow breaths your brain's like oh no something bad is happening let me freak out and so you want to make sure to tell your brain we're okay with those nice long deep breaths yeah interesting interesting i like that um last last question before we open up for some q a yeah. do you have and, and we, we covered just now a couple good tips. So mm -hmm. to, to have a schedule so that your brain doesn't have to do, you know, that many problem solving, yeah. all too long, yes. that helps a lot, um, to try and do things with people. Yeah. Do you have any other tips, especially for, for families? Because I think families being home all the time, they kind of have a unique stress that they haven't had before because usually, mm -hmm. you know, a family, people go to work and go to school and then they come home. And if, you're, if you weren't already homeschooling, to all of a sudden be homeschooling is kind of because mm -hmm. everyone's spending so much more time together than they usually do. Any tips, any tips for that? Yeah, so um, I would say when you think about your family and when you think about your home specifically, you can get, I guess I'll use the word 
stuck, but you kind of think about your home in a very specific way. So this is my bedroom and this is the kitchen where we eat and maybe now it's becoming where school happens. And this is the living room where we watch TV. But I, I would say that one thing that you can do is maybe use your home a little differently. So for example, I have a couple of closets in my apartment that are just for you know, uh, clothes for the winter or you know things that I'm not using right now, and I could clean those out, right? Because it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> and so maybe I can make that a little, you know, like sanctuary. If there were a lot of people in my place, I could use that as my solo private time. Everyone knows this is the place where you go when you're by yourself and you just want to get away from everybody for a little while. Um, and because I know kids, like you might want to say like, go take a walk, but some kids are, are too little for that to do on their own. And so maybe creating different ways to use your space at home. So maybe certain rooms, maybe not the whole time, but certain rooms during certain times of the day are this right? It's school now, but it's only school until two o'clock. Um, and then the closet over here is where you go if you're just feeling overwhelmed <laughs> by everyone, right? There's a little light in there. Maybe there's like, you know, soft pillows on the floor or something like that. So I would say use your space a little bit more creatively in terms of what you do in the different rooms and, and in those different spaces. And also, again, I think so much of it is just acknowledging that it's okay to be annoyed by your family right now. Um, <laughs> as much as we are social, again, we are really meant to be um, social with lots of different people. And I like to think about human interaction kind of like our diet, right? The food that we eat. And in fact, I often think about social media kind of like junk food. So it'll fill you up right? And it's kind of fun every once in a while, but it's not good for you in the long run if that's all you're eating. Well, that's the only thing all you're doing. Yeah. But, but so can, if you have to survive on junk food for a month, you can. <laughs> right. But you also, that's why I'm saying you want to vary it up in terms of what you're normally doing on social media, but you also crave that with other people, right? You crave, just like you crave different kinds of foods, you also need different types of interaction. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, those you know, those spaces in your home where you are allowed to be alone physically, that might be where you interact with other people. Um, and I think part of it is that we are also used to our family being who we come home to and say how our day went, right? But when your entire day was with those same people, there's nothing to talk about because everyone is experiencing the same thing. So the other thing is to maybe try and have varied experiences on your own in some way so that you can um, mm -hmm. come back and talk about them. And I actually have one more really cool idea for social interactions that you could also do with your family is to try and think of new ways to interact with other people. So for example, you could start writing letters to someone else mm. in your neighborhood and leave them right in places to find. And that's kind of going really, really old school. But part of human interaction is, is the excitement of what could come next. And so maybe writing letters or writing in chalk to a friend that you, you know, every day you can come back and see a new message or, or find a new letter that in and of itself can be exciting enough to give mm -hmm. you that little bit of jolt of, of human interaction that we're used to having. I love that. Those are really good tips. I want to give just a, a quick shout out to a few people who had really good suggestions in the chat. Raina oh, said they um, took the playroom and changed it into a schoolroom. So that then since the studying happens in one place and then they move locations for other things, that sort of helps their routine. A great um, idea. Mm -hmm. Andy says she has a cat with the same name as your name. She was, oh, yeah. I, that was, that was fun. <laughs> I would say they should be friends, but she's not social at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> And then the most common, we've had so many great psychology questions. Maybe we'll have to have you come okay. on again to, to answer more of them. But the most popular one has been, what's your favorite part of psychology? Oh, my gosh. So many things. But so one, I will say, I do have an answer to what is my favorite psychology fact. And it kind of has to do with social psychology, but it also has to do with the brain. So one of my favorite psychology facts is that babies, when they're born, can actually hear every single language sound that exists in the entire world. And as they grow and develop, they only keep the ones that are important for their own language that is spoken at home. So little, little babies can actually hear more sound than adults can because they're trying to figure out which language is going to be the one that is important for them. And I just think that's 
super fascinating. That is super fascinating. Right? I, I studied Arabic for a little bit and I remember there were a couple sounds where I would try and say it and they'd be like, no, no, you said this one. And I'd be like, they exactly. sound the same to me. I can't yes. hear the difference. Yes. And so that's actually one reason we have accents when we try and learn a different language as we're older. We literally can't hear the sound that we're trying to recreate. And so we do our best, but it's going to sound nothing like it sounds in the original language. So we often tell our friends who want their children to speak a second language, start them young so that they can keep those um, neurons that are in the brain that are meant to hear those sounds for later on. That is fascinating. Another really good question. Michelle asks, so when you smile, does that actually make you feel happier? It does. Yes. What? So there, yes, I know. <laughs> so this is actually one thing that I tell my students all the time on test day. So when they have exams, I tell them that the research shows that if you smile, it tells your brain that you're okay. And I just tell them it has to be a real smile, not like not like that. that <laughs> no. brain, but yes, yeah, smiling it, it does actually calm you down. Again, it's because it's telling your brain everything must be okay if we're smiling, right? Um, and so I think uh, sometimes people feel during these kinds of really um, tragic events that it's not okay to laugh, it's not okay to have a good time. But it's really important for our mental health to take some breaks from the news, from the the you know awful things that are happening. Just take a little bit and smile and laugh and, and it's it's really okay to do that. Oh I love that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mark. Yeah, thank you for sharing this with us. This has been wonderful. And I think We've gotten so many good psychology questions. I think we'll definitely have to plan a part two sometime later. <laughs> okay, we'll that sounds great. I'm more, happy to join. Awesome. We'll go more in detail. But I hope, I hope those of you in the chat, I hope this has been helpful. And if you're watching the replay, I hope you got some good ideas. And to end with, I'd sort of like everyone in the chat to just say something that has made you smile this last week. Yeah. And maybe awesome. as those are flying by, maybe some people will get good ideas of things mm -hmm. that, that they could try. To, to bring a little joy and a little creativity into their quarantine life. So I'm seeing Panda Corn says playing Roblox makes, makes them smile. Um, fill up our chat for just a second as we're saying goodbye to Dr. Marshall. Fill it up with things that have made you smile this week. Corey says family. Science mom. <laughs> yep, King Potato says science mom. Woohoo! <laughs> and now Math Dad's like, what about me? Agni says Math Dad. Oh. <laughs> and let's have some snaps and claps for Dr. Marshall because Dr. Yay, Marshall is having a has definitely made me smile. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. I love the show and I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of it. You're welcome. Everyone say goodbye. Bye. That was wonderful. I'm so happy that that worked out. And thank you to everyone in the chat for the, the snaps and the claps and for the, the, the things that are still coming through about what's what made you smile. I'm seeing video games. I'm seeing my guinea pig. I'm seeing my baby brother in his shoes. Um, going outside, watching a praying mantis hatch. I'm seeing so many great things. And I hope that if you are able to watch the chat that you'll get some good ideas of great projects and things that you can try. And speaking of projects, oh, and Pixelbit has asked several times, do you believe in nature or nurture? We will definitely, that's such an interesting question. We wanna give that one more time, but we'll definitely see if we can get back to psychology and answer that one in more detail later. We still have some more fun things planned though, so don't go anywhere. We do, we do. So yesterday we had our little craft project was to make, take an egg carton and make a animal out of it. So I made a little caterpillar and my caterpillar will actually move around because I attached little strings and made it into a puppet. Math Dad, you want to uh, share yours? So I got mine started last time. So I've got my, my little bug here and yeah, crawls around. He's really fast, but he has something special. He's got little TV screens underneath. So he'll run up to people and they'll jump onto their eyes and they will only see what's on the TV screen. So he can't actually do mind control, but they'll just see what he, he's showing them. <laughs> and so then he can get them to walk all over the place and interact because they just think they're seeing the real world, but really they're seeing the bottom of the bug. And he's got his fake eyes here. So people won't notice. A very so sneaky bug. Infiltration bug, yeah. <laughs> And then for today, our Friday Fun Project today is about Mobius strips. So we are going to explore these and then we'll show you the little Chia Pet eggshell pets that we're making and Math Dad will answer his math mystery. But Math Dad, tell us about a Mobius strip. Okay, so a Mobius strip is a super interesting little 
thing here. Uh, I, I basically just took some strips of paper and you, you could just tape them together and you get this loop. So, so something of a cylinder shape, but with a Mobius strip, I've done the same thing, but I gave it a twist before reattaching. So now this, I call this a Mobius strip, uh, it's M, it's O with little umlauts above it, B-I-U-S, Mobius was the, the name of a, of a mathematician who kind, kind of studied these. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure people have made these up long before he got around, but it's really interesting. There's some properties here that I want to show you. And one of those properties is going to be illustrated by, I'm just going to draw a stripe down the center of this. We start here on the top. And I'm just drawing a red stripe. You know why I'll do this? I'll just sing a song. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. Oh, it's going to be in my head all day. Oh, I did it while you were out of the room. <laughs> I heard it from the other room as I was coming back. All right, I'm still just tracing it around. And finally, something weird happened. I traced it around over and over and over. And guess what? Everything, both sides, what? It's all one continuous line. What just happened there? That, that, was, that was weird. It turns out there's only one side to a Mobius strip. There's Wait. not a top and a bottom. There's not a front and a back. There's just one side. Which seems crazy because it's a piece of paper. A piece of paper has two sides. But that line connects. Yeah, pe pieces of paper like this do not have two sides. It's, it's kind of crazy. All right. And we would get something similar if I just started drawing along an edge. If I draw along this edge and kind of color it all the way around, well, guess what? That's both edges. It's the only edge. There is only one edge. There's only one face on this. We call this a non-orientable surface because it just doesn't have a top and a bottom. And yeah, it's kind of weird. And it's just this two-dimensional piece here, but you actually have to use three dimensions to make it so that it doesn't intersect itself. So you fancy your name for this. This is an example of what a mathematician would call a manifold. So something that looks just like a plane when you're only looking locally. If you were standing on top of this and this was the size of the earth, you wouldn't know whether you were on a plane or on, on something else, but but yeah, it's really kind of a cool surface. And I've got some, some interesting questions we want to explore about this Mobius strip and about this guy here. Are you, are you going to need scissors? I'm going to need scissors. Okay, I'm going to grab different ones because oh, they're harder they're, to cut. Yeah, be, be bad, bad scissors. All right, yeah, we're we're going we're gonna to see what happens if we cut these shapes. So in the chat, what do you think is going to happen if I cut a cylinder? And what do you think is going to happen if I cut a Mobius strip? So I'm just going to cut up the middle. Hmm. So it's an interesting question. And... I know some of you at home are getting out the scissors already. I might recommend that you rewatch later because you, you'll, you'll be distracted and you'll miss what we cover. But of course, do what you want to do. All right. So science mom's going to cut down the center of the Mobius strip. I'm going to cut down the center of the cylinder. I think you can probably guess what's going to happen with the cylinder. All right. Cut, 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 cut. All right. I'm almost to the end here with my last snip. What is going to happen when this one is cut in half? So with the cylinder, I got two separate rings. Okay, no, no surprise there. With this one? Whoa, it's just one big ring. Aha, she ended up with a bigger Mobius strip. And, and this one it... actually happens to have uh, three twists in it instead of just <laughs> the one twist. But but fortunately, it's it's thin enough that it's it still works. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I, I want to give a quick shout out to Cody and the other um, King Potato and the others who are always um, King Daniel who are trying to 
get the likes on the video up. I think it's it's really fun for us to see that like we're 120 likes. Come on, we can do it. Yeah. So now this new Mobius strip, it turns out it only has one face and it only has one edge. It just happens to have three twists in it. What would happen if we were to cut it again? Well, they're gonna. Are you sure? Okay. So I'm set, gonna find set, out. Set we'll do this for us. All right. All right. So I've got some other interesting questions that I want to ask. Here I have two cylinders that I have taped together, kind of it, so per perpendicular to each other. I'm going to cut these guys down the center. And I want you to speculate what is going to happen. What what type of shape or shapes are we going to get when we cut down the center of this this guy? Kind, kind of a weird looking shape. It's not clear. All right, so Science Mom has cut down the center of the Mobius strip Whoa. yet again. And we ended up with two loops, two interlo interlocking. Uh, I think that's just one continuous strip, actually. Is it? There's like a it knot. It has in a middle. knot in it. Okay, it's a one continuous strip with a knot. <gasps> that's what we got when we I, cut it again. I didn't know that would come out with a knot in it. Well, that's that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. See if you can undo that knot just for a minute. Maybe it's All a right. fake knot. So, so sometimes it looks like you have a knot, but you don't. All right. So, in the chat, did anybody come up with a speculation? All right. No. No. Nobody. Wrote, okay. I get a couple loops. It's, it's a legit knot. Trust me. All right, it's a legitimate knot. That thing's not coming undone. Okay, I think the chat's a little behind what I can see. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna cut this guy down the center. It is also, it's two distinct loops. Is it? Yes. They're, they're not. Look at that. That independent? one, that loop is independent from the other loop. See, two loops, hmm. not connected. I gotta say, I don't think that was what I anticipated. So Math Dad has two loops that are not Mobius strips. All right. Cut one of them. Just cutting down the center here. Hold it up higher so they can see. All right, cutting, 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 cutting down the center. All right, and the shape we get is what? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It's a, it's a square. That thing made a square. So if you think about it, yeah, if, if I were to fold it back in half this way, and then we were to fold it back in half like so, yeah, we, we, we could put it back together, and we, we had the two kind of perpendicular uh, let's see, cylinders that were, were interlocked. But yeah, kind of crazy, huh? Yeah. I'm seeing several several comments in the chat saying, "Whoa! Like, did not expect that." Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know anybody who's managed to predict, to predict that one. All right, I've got another cutting job for Science Mom here. I've got a Mobius strip. This time, I don't want her to cut it in half. I want her to cut it in thirds. Ooh, so I'm going to go around twice, basically. But, but, but that's that's exactly gonna, what happens. All right, you're... so I'm going to start cutting here, and then I'm going to cut there. Mm, so. so. Kind of an interesting challenge to see, yeah, what is going on. So I'm just with this, just keeping it close to this one edge, because that's going to be the easiest as I go around, trying to keep it about a third of the way away. And then when I get around here, I'm on the other, because there's yeah. only one edge, so I'm not lining up with where I did the first cut. So I just keep going, keep going. That's right. This is very different than just cutting a cylinder into thirds. It's taken a while. Yeah. Okay. This, this one's definitely fun enough. You should you should be trying this at home. Although. All right. And now I'm going to match up to my original cut that I made, and let's see what the shape is. What? Look at oh. that! It is a big loop and a small loop. Yeah. Big, big bigger Mobius strip and a smaller one. So th this one on the outside has the extra twist in it, but is a Mobius strip. And interlocked there is a is smaller a small one. copy of the original. Mobius strip. I was not expecting that. That is pretty cool. I thought for sure we would get like, oh, I don't know. I thought it would either be one big one with extra twists or that they would fall apart. Like we'd have two separate ones. Can you cut it so you get two separate ones? 
Uh, maybe a strip. Because I see you have other papers there. I'm curious. Okay. What let's... are these other papers going to be? All right. Well, I mean, w one interesting thing I, I did, or maybe less interesting, I, I said, okay, Mobius strip is with one twist. Here, I've got a paper with two twists in two it. Two twists. So now there actually is a top and a bottom. There are two different sides to this, but there, there are two twists in this guy. Science model. Yes. Let's, let's cut that up. Cut that in half. See what okay. happens. Yeah, it's, it can be a, a little little surprising. Sometimes we don't have intuition on some things that are very simple. And some, I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult. I, 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 sh I should know all this stuff by now. I should know how the world works. But I get surprised by some of these basic things all the time. All right. Loops. Whoa. Interlocking. Interlocking loops, just loops. like with the third one. But so, these are both twisted twice, it looks th That's like. right. There. So they're two copies of what we had before, just half as wide. But hmm. they are interlocking. But when we did when we cut the one strip in half, it just made a bigger circle. That's right. So now, now I'm curious what would happen if we did that and cut it into thirds. Although it, it went, once I, you it get small enough, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. I, it probably wouldn't make too much difference. All right. Now I have two Mobius strips that I have taped together, perpendicular to each other, and I actually have these two Mobius strips. If I did it right, I twisted one one direction, I twisted the other one another direction. All right, so I'm going to have Science Mom cut this one in half along. She'll cut each of the Mobius strips in half. And I'm curious, what type of shape do we expect to get so this time? Without but, Mobius strips, you got a square. That, that, that's right. So last time, we made this square. And that was with two cylinders that were glued together in this, this same way. Now we have two Mobius strips. Is there any prediction about what we're going to get in this case? Ah. Okay. So, whoa, that's kind of weird. My first one's done. <laughs> and now I have just this bigger path that I'm just going to cut straight down the line. All right. Let's, let's see. I mean, ultimately, we might just get a mess, right? <laughs> you, you try things. Sometimes they work out to be interesting. And sometimes you just get a pile of mud. And oh, it's two hearts. <sighs> Look at that. Yeah. So two interlocking hearts. Oh, <laughs> I was not expecting that at all. It was really looking like it, looking like it was just going to be a mess. That was my prediction as I was getting close to cutting that one. That's How right. fun. So, so that one only works if you have a. Uh, twisted the Mobi two Mobius strips in different directions from each other. Other otherwise you'll get something that's not as pretty as two hearts. Although it's something. So now there are hours of exploration to, to do just with pieces of paper. Um, cutting them, putting them together, and yeah, gluing. So the areas of math that are involved in, in this type of thing. So we're, we're talking about topology and also some some geometry. And yeah, it's the, the world we live in is a fascinating place. Uh, but what would it be like if instead of living on a, a globe like we do on a sphere, we lived on a Mobius strip? That'd be crazy. Um, someone just asked if this was how you proposed, because if not, you totally missed out a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I didn't know about this at the time. But yeah, he did not propose with Mobius with a Mobius strip. Yeah, this uh, that would have been good. That would have been romantic. <laughs> <laughs> No woman could say no to that type of proposal. <laughs> <laughs> right. so. there, there are a couple a couple good questions that came in that I want to answer real quick because we're getting close to being um, out of time. So one one question that we had. <coughs> oh, and we have to show our, yeah, yeah, our little egg things. Just like, we okay. can answer questions. We've got All right. We'll show you some stuff show. first. So, so why don't we just hold up the tray? Right. Our cabbages are continuing to color. So yesterday we showed you guys how... If you put food coloring in because of transpiration, the cabbage is drying up the water, and then the cabbage leaves are starting to change color according to what food coloring container they're in. <clears throat> so that's been rather fun. And then I also suggested putting one cabbage leaf in water, and you guys can see this is still, it's a firm leaf, and if I were to bite into it, it's kind of crunchy and tastes like raw cabbage, which is not that great. Cabbage is better cooked. This leaf, on the other hand, was left out all night. And look how floppy this is. It is a floppy, flaccid, poor, dried out leaf because it doesn't have water and it's starting to lose its 
a lot of its mass because of the water. So that's a fun kind of experiment too, to compare a leaf in water versus one without. You'll see that the leaf without water starts to lose its structure pretty quickly. And then we have, for our engineering challenge, was kind of an assignment here. We, oh, I thought this guy had a face on it. That one doesn't have a face. Oh, I picked these, up the wrong one. These ones do. Let me, let me introduce you to Happy, Scaredy Pants, and Sir Frowns a lot. <laughs> So these eggshells, we cracked on the top and then we planted chia seeds in the top and just filled them up with dirt from outside. And we've been watering them and they're starting to grow hair. And if you don't have chia seeds, there are a lot of other type of seeds that you can use. Here are some that we used with wheat berries. So we've got little wheat berries sprouting up top that will be like um, grass. And that is our, our sort of our challenge, our craft for you over the weekend is to start your own little eggshell chia pet. If you don't have any eggs, you can use any other type of container you want, or you could use a plastic Easter egg. Anything will work. And if you have some, some clay or Play-Doh, you can make a little base form so they don't fall over. Put dirt in, put seeds in, draw a face on it, and then watch them grow hair over the next week. That's right. And then maybe next Friday, we can have people show off what their chia pets have started to look like. Yes. They, I will say, once you plant them and get them wet, you'll want to cover it with a cloth or a little plastic bag for a couple of days so the seeds don't dry out. Because if your seeds dry out, then they're not going to germinate and sprout. So that's my one, my one tip for that. And then a question we got yesterday that I thought was really good was, what is pollen and how does pollen work? Because we were talking about plants. So I'll just answer real quick. You can just tell the art prompt. Oh, yes. And our art prompt is, what is our art prompt? It's been a long week, you guys. Okay, I don't know. I didn't. Our art prompt is someone help me out. You, you, I posted you, you that online. The question and All right. But pollen. Pollen is how a, it's kind of like half of a seed. So to make new seeds, plants have to get they have to share information with another plant. And the pollen is half of that information. And a lot of plants are pollinated by wind. So if you have allergies right now, the reason you have allergies is because a lot of different plants in the springtime they put the pollen out and it's a tiny, tiny little capsule that has some protein in it. And then inside has a bit of DNA. And that DNA is going to help um, form a new plant. All right. No, no, nobody chimed in with the art prompt. Nobody chimed in with the art prompt. Uh oh. It's, it's on Facebook and it's in Instagram. And it will come to me. So, oh, so, it's so, so, perspective of a bird to draw something from the perspective of a bird. So if you can see a bird, thank you, Nicole, a bird's perspective. If you see a bird outside, or if you don't see any birds outside, you can imagine if a bird were outside, what would it be doing? And what would the world look like to the bird? We really enjoyed the mm -hmm. ant's perspective art and just the variety of things that came with that. So this one is to like think like a bird and what would a bird see? And it can be high flying, it can be like low, like under some bushes, whatever you would like. Mm. Thank you, now I'm seeing several people. Thank you, Nora, and all the other people who are Krista, who are reminding us of what the art challenge is. And last but not least, we will end with sharing more of the fantastic art submissions that came in from yesterday's art prompt. Right. Our plantimals. So right. we have some great plantimals here that we started with and we'll play to go through the rest. Oh, a tiger, tiger petals. petals. Very nice, Amelia. And Alexis did a flat part cat, part flower. <laughs> I love it. A tig tree. Ooh, Nicely a tree done. Tree tail. I like it, Graham. Raylin. Ooh. It does fan a tulip dragon. I love it. Yeah. A nature cat lives in a forest. It needs berries. Good at hiding. Good job, Grace. Great work. Oh, this one's <laughs> fun. <laughs> kind of a dragon tree. Yep. The horse has flowers on it to hide in flower bushes. I have to say, it would really help. Very good job, Violet. It would really help to be camouflaged if you had plant parts on you. That's right. Lives in the woods. And, ooh, I like bear it. Tree. A bear tree. <laughs> Great job, Connor. A tree raft digs itself in the ground so predators can't see it and thinks it's just a tree. Great work, <laughs> Liam. And yesterday, our, our art project that we did was painting a prickly pear cactus. So There's great quarters. job, Porter. 
iceberg penguin lives in the Antarctic, gets energy through fish and sunlight. <laughs> Very nice. That would be one tough plantimal. Penguins do spend a lot of time just standing there. They do. They do. Good job, Hudson. Briar. Ooh, and Briar did a banana dog. <laughs> oh, banana horse. Half horse, banana, half banana. It would live under and poop out masks for the hospitals. I love it. <laughs> Very useful animal. Indeed. A cat us. Oh, this is fantastic. It lives in the desert and is in the cactus kingdom. Liet. And, oh, Liet did um, a flower that eats Liet. cat food. I love it. <laughs> so these are both sort of like cat plant animals. Good job, Abby. Ooh, another cat cuss. I love it. What a great idea. Good job, Thea. Yeah. Sea, sea willow. Ooh. <laughs> And it's not a dangerous jellyfish, does not sting, collects plastic and eats it. Oh, I tell you, Avery, if we could have a plastic eating animal or microorganism, that would be awesome. Lily has an Elvis plant. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Named after her cat, Elvis. That's a great name for a cat. The naked moss rat. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Great job, Jake. A coyote plus a cactus, it, that's wonderful. It would thrive here in the desert it would. where we live. Yep, so. and no other animals would want to touch it because of those spines. Plant Very man. Nice. Oh, and lives on Jupiter. Palm poppy, hybrid between a pomerian and a poppy. Wonderful. Like Renata. A pig bush. Pig bushy. Declan. Very good. <laughs> wonderful. Oh, we have a whole entire ecosystem here with like a pitcher plant horse and a bub rose, a little frog, a vermilion. Ooh, I love it. I'd love to visit that. And an owl twig. Oh, Zach, this is this one's great. We're hungry. It's a hybrid of a bamboo plant and a panda. Jameson did a spine chomp. I love it. <laughs> a cat that and a leaf and grass. A fox flower. Good job, Colton. And Hans has a cat, cat cumber. cumber. <laughs> and Rashab did very nice. The nocturnal lottle, and that's where we'll end. And if you um, have not seen your artwork or want to know how to get your artwork featured, um, Science Mom Krista and Liza look for that for us on Facebook and on Instagram. And so if you share it on the album on Facebook or share it on Instagram and tag us, then they'll be sure to see it. And for best chances of being featured, make sure you do it before 7 p.m., the day before the show, because that's usually when they gather the slides and then send them over to me. So thank you again, you guys, for all your support. I can't believe that this is our 20th day. It's Kinda it's crazy. been it's been amazing. And we're so happy that we have been able to share quarantine with you. And we're really excited that we can keep going. And that's all thanks to you guys, our viewers, and to our patrons. Will you be doing an art lesson today? Yes, so I will be back in, whoa, like six minutes. Yep. <laughs> I'll be back soon with an Earth Day art prompt. All right, thanks for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun. And we'll see you next week or in five minutes. <laughs>